What information can we get out of this image? Okay, so we're looking at DNA. Can we tell the difference? How can we use this information to tell whether or not very appropriate for this chapter? Is this prokaryotic or eukaryotic? So we got one eukaryote vote. I see some other people nodding their heads. Sir? Does anybody want to defend that perspective? Why would this be eukaryotic DNA, not prokaryotic? It's linear. So these are linear chromosomes. What would we expect if this was prokaryotic? Circular. Okay, just making sure everyone read. So, and maybe attended bio 1A and bio 1B. Okay, so beyond that, that's excellent. So you can look at a chromosome spread like this one. The first thing you can say is, is it circular or is it linear, prokaryotic or eukaryotic? Can we infer anything else by looking at this image? What does a practicing cytogeneticist, someone who looks at chromosomes for a living, get out of this picture? What's this big blob up here that looks kind of like a fuzzy brain or something? It's not a brain. Any thoughts? Does anybody happen to know? I'm just curious. This wasn't part of the reading yet. This is actually what we'll get into next class. What stage of the cell cycle these chromosomes are from? Is this interphase? Is this mitosis? Is it meiosis? At what, part, at what point in DNA replication are the chromosomes condensed? It's during replication. So what are the four steps of replication? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and then blah, 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 blah. what? Telophase. OK. So at what stage are the chromosomes really highly condensed before they segregate into the two daughter cells? It's metaphase. So these are metaphase chromosomes. This is, again, just introduction to what we'll start talking about in class next time. This is where we can visualize the chromosomes as condensed objects, things that you and I would probably look at and call chromosomes. What sort of an organism is this from, aside from eukaryotic? Can we get any more detailed information just by looking at this image? Could you tell a plant versus animal? Some brave soul must. Did that, let's make it an easier question. Did the chapter we just read talk about distinguishing plant and animal chromosomes at all? Did it even have the word plant in it? Not sure. So is this a plant or an animal? Okay, so this gentleman in the back makes a very good point that a lot of plants tend to have more than two copies of every chromosome. So what's the term we use when you have two copies of every chromosome? Your dip, diploid, right? Two copies of each chromosome. So if we looked at these chromosomes and we could tell that these were polyploid, more than two copies, poly many copies, then that might give us an idea maybe this is a plant, because a lot of plants tend to be polyploid, have more than two sets of every chromosome. Is it a plant? There's a piece of information on here that if it's really subtle, it's in smaller font, it's in the bottom right hand corner of the screen that might give you some information about what sort of an organism this is. So this is in the bottom of the screen here, which hopefully you're familiar with a bit. Every time I show an image that's not an image I created, 
I'll give the reference where I found that image. This is from a journal. What's the name of the journal? It's the one in italics. Not et al. That means and others. First author was, I don't know how to pronounce Eastern European names, Gooch Skechik, maybe. And others. So the people that made this image in 2002 published this in Clinical Genetics. It's an, it's an abbreviation, but so are we going to find metaphase chromosome spreads of plants in a journal called Clinical Genetics? Who says yes? Let's do a quick poll. Clinical, ge clinical Genetics. Okay, who thinks maybe it's not a plant set of chromosomes? Right. This is a human set of chromosomes. It's in Clinical Genetics. This is a journal where doctors publish in for interesting case studies about humans. So these are human chromosomes. As was already mentioned, there should be two copies of each. Does anybody know how many copies, how many sets of, how many, sorry, how many chromosomes humans have? How many pairs? 23. Oops. Wrong tool. Humans. 23 pairs. And we're diploid, which means we have how many total chromosomes in a cell? 46. How many objects are in this picture? So the gentleman in the back made mention of if we looked at all these chromosomes, we might be able to tell just from I'm interpreting now. We could count how many chromosomes are here. Maybe that would tell us something about what species this is. Because not every species has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Humans do. So do we have an estimate? Is that? Oh, it definitely looks more than 46. So about half of it is like 40. Okay, so you're, this is excellent modeling science, especially for exams. So what I was about to ask everybody was maybe for next class, and you should try doing this, for next class, be prepared to show up and just discuss at the beginning how many objects are in this picture. How many things that you would call a chromosome are there? And I used to do this for a living when I worked in stickleback fish, so this is the way I did it. I just made a little dot on every object when I counted it so that I didn't accidentally double count one. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera. So that's an, it's an easy way to do it. But I like the approach of just maybe dividing this in a quarter, like you're suggesting. Look at a quarter of this set of chromosomes and count that. And multiply it by four and see, is it closer to 46 or is it closer to something bigger? And you sound like you're suggesting it's something bigger. So we can get a lot of information about DNA, about organisms, and about problems that those organisms might be encountering just by looking at the chromosomes. We don't need much more than this to learn a lot about somebody. Now, because this is a eukaryote and not a prokaryote, linear chromosomes, this is the last point on this slide, what features of every chromosome can we discern? Let's look at this really long chromosome right there. What parts of that chromosome can we talk about? Can we talk about the centromere, which is where microtubules in the spindle grab the chromosomes and separate them during mitosis and meiosis. So that's about maybe right there. We'll abbreviate it C-E-N for centromere. And then what else? If you're going to talk about the centromere, you better talk about the telomeres. How many telomeres in this case? We'll get into it in a little bit more detail, but we'll just for now say there's two. The ends of the chromosomes. Abbreviate it T-E-L for telomere. And of course, if you're a prokaryote, you don't have to worry about any of this. You don't have a centromere, and you don't have ends of your chromosomes, so you don't have telomeres. Any questions at this point? So the, the origin of replication? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. I, see, we're communicating. I know what's going on. 
So how can you tell where the origin of replication is? So that's another one of the key vocabulary points. Centromeres, telomeres, origin of replication, linear, circular. Origin of replication, let me make a note to bring this up again later in the term. It's really hard to figure out where the origins of replication are. Sometimes it's easy. Bacteria, you can look where the chromosome strands are starting to separate during replication. You can do the same thing for eukaryotes. Where do those two tightly connected chromosomes start to come apart where replication starts? So you'd have to do another, what, order of magnitude or so, maybe tenfold more magnification of this to see. And I'm not exactly sure what magnification this is. This is human. Human chromosomes are pretty big, so this might be a 40x objective or something like that. Nothing extraordinary. And in Biology 104, for the biologists, and maybe some other classes for those of you in different majors, you'll get a chance to do some cited genetics looking at chromosomes in the microscopes. Chromosomes that you extract, that is, not just slides that we purchased from somewhere. That's kind of... Yes, sir. So that's what I would love to do. So the suggestion is, let's make a karyotype. The karyotype being, sometimes you see pictures where the chromosomes are lined up. They're organized by size and by shape. And so you'll see everybody, somebody has neatly cut out all the chromosomes from one of those metaphase chromosome spreads, like the picture in the previous slide. And they organize them by size and by shape. And they pair them up so that you know this is a chromosome 1, version A, and version B, the two copies, and so forth. I would love to be able to let us do that. I want you to be able to make your own karyogram. In fact, that's what I wanted everybody to do on that previous picture. I haven't found the right app for it yet. I do that professionally in Photoshop, and I don't want to have you guys go buy a $400, $800 software package just to do one exercise in class. If somebody can find me an app that lets you digitally cut out and flip and rotate objects. I mean, I know you can do that on a desktop computer. Can you do it on a tablet? Should be able to. Can, it, can we do it for free? I don't know. So if you can find a free app that'll let me do that, I would love it. But yes, absolutely. So you can make karyograms, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about when we keep talking about that metaphase chromosome set that we just looked at. Other questions? So it's going to be the typical class outline, which you'll get used to eventually. So we're going to start with, which was Chargaff's rules. If you look at one strand of G DNA, are the percent A's necessarily equal to the percent T's? How many A's are there? Three. How many T's are there? Two. Are they equal? No. What about G's and C's? Uh, oh, I screwed up the example. Equal number of G's and C's. But the A's and T's aren't equal. So if you're a virus and you've got a single-stranded genome, there's no reason to expect the, the percent of G's equal to the percent of C's. However, if you made this double-stranded, then what happens? If, you're, if you have a double-stranded genome, Now what's true? For every A, there's a T on the other strand. For every T, there's an A on the other strand. Now all of a sudden, just by being double-stranded, we have Chargaff's rule. So what's the most important point from all of this? What do you think? If you're double-stranded, you fit the rule. If you're single-stranded, you break the rule. The really important point that I'd like all of you to take away is that we learn really interesting things in biology by finding organisms that don't fit our expectations. It's the organisms that break the rules we say, holy shit, what's going on? That we learn something by studying those rare exceptions.
any questions about Chargaff's rules, the data, Google Sheets? Okay. Let's say you had a DNA sequence that was something like this, and during DNA replication, DNA polymerase screwed up. What happens to Chargaff's rule now? Does everybody spot the mutation? Let's play spot the mutation. What's wrong? Right, See, the C and the T aren't supposed to base pair. So I'll, I'll often abbreviate or note mutations with an asterisk. So we have a mutation. How does this affect Chargaff's rule? We don't have an equal number of C's and G's because of this mutation. There should be a G there, and that would mean that the number of C's equal the number of G's, but we don't. So there are lots of reasons why Chargaff's rule doesn't quite play out as nicely as he might have liked. But considering, like, let's take the second molecule, there's a 2 percent difference between G and C and A and T. Wouldn't that be a really large percent difference considering Okay, so the question is, when we look at Diplococcus pneumoniae, it's got 20% G, 18% C. The question essentially is, is that a big deal? It's 2% difference. So quick critical thinking discussion. Is it percentages that we're really interested in? Or is it some other measurement of the number of G's and C's? Which would, which would be better, to actually have a count of this many G's and this many C's in the genome, or a percentage? Well, let's take a genome that's this size, this example I just wrote out. What's the percent C? We've got seven, 14 nucleotides. So we've got 2 fourteenths C and what, 1 fourteenth G, 1 out of 14. That looks like a pretty big difference percent-wise. What, what are those percentages? You guys have calculators in front of you. I'm bad at math on the spot. Spotlights are getting really bright. 1 out of 14, smaller than 1 out of 10, so it's like 7.5% or something like that. G, and 2 out of 14 would be twice that. Am I doing the math right? Somebody tell me. Just a little over 7%. Just a little over 7%, so that would make that about 15% C. Holy crap. Twice as much C as G. But there's only one mutation. So the point I'm making is you want to know how big the genome is. How many base pairs are there that you're looking at when you see there's a difference between 20% and 18%? A 2% difference, if you're talking about a tiny little chromosome organism, might not be that many actual nucleotide differences. So you might explain 20 versus 18% as mutation if you've got a small genome. If you've got a genome the size of a human, billions of base pairs, then what does that mean when you talk about a 2% difference? Now you're talking about millions of DNA differences. So scale matters here. It's not just percent that's always useful to think about. Thank you very much for that question. So mutation might explain a lot of this, but the numbers are still pretty big, 20% versus 18%. The last answer might be experimental error. I don't remember, I don't ever, by the way, make a mental note, I don't ever want anybody to memorize a date. This isn't a history class. I don't know when Chargaff did these experiments. I know it was a long time ago when the technology wasn't that great. So was he able to really accurately measure the percent G's, percent C's, percent A's, percent T's? I'm just gonna say no. 
So there's some experimental error here. Maybe it was 20% and 18% plus or minus 5% error. So there are lots of reasons why the A's, the T's, the G's, and the C's aren't exactly the same. So we talked about this already. Yes, please. Absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. So we've got even more advanced genetics going on already in the class. So certain amino acids are encoded by DNA that has more Gs and Cs, so you could hypothesize a totally valid hypothesis. And this is what I mean by being creative when you come up with reasons to explain things that you observe. So maybe one reason that an organism has lots of Gs and Cs is because it has needs proteins that have lots of amino acids that are encoded by nucleotides that are Gs and Cs. Absolutely. Could be. We'd have to do some experimental design, create some experiments, and test that hypothesis. Okay. Oh, by the way, sorry, one more point about Chargap. So one of you left a comment. I don't know who it is. I know your name, but I'm not going to call you out. But please speak up if you want left a really interesting comment on the Google Classroom, just to me, about why is it that the percentages that Chargaff measured weren't exactly the same? For every organism, why wasn't it exactly 31.6% C and 31.6% G? I sort of blew that off. I said, ah, it's approximately 32% A and T. Is that a reasonable thing to do? Is there a reason that the A's and T's aren't exactly the same? Why might that be? So the reason I thought to ask that question was mentioned mutation. Somebody mentioned mutation. So what if there's a mutation? Yep. So we're, now, we're talking, now we're getting into junk DNA. So we've got lots of differences between, not within a genome, but between genomes, between species that have to do with the so-called junk DNA, which we also read about in this chapter. So let's talk about junk DNA. Now I always prepare, so I'm, I'm going to skip ahead, give me like a minute or two to complain about what's in between. I always prepare more for a class than I know we're going to get to because I like to have some things in case people ask questions. I've already got some resources prepared. If you go, just by the way, if you go to that first image we were looking at before class and you make a karyotype, which is what this is, cutting out all the chromosomes and arranging them so they're all paired up, what do we see about this individual? Two copies of every chromosome? Four. So this is a really, really, really rare case of a human who was born tetraploid. Four copies of every chromosome. And as far as anybody knows, she's the human that survived the longest without dying, because tetraploidy, usually, if you've got four copies of every chromosome, if you're a human, weir weirdly, it's a bad thing. If you're a plant, say, sometimes that's OK. We've got plants that have eight copies of chromosomes, 12 copies of chromosomes. Some strawberries have 12 copies of every chromosome. Right? Wheat, flour, the type of wheat you're growing have different numbers of chromosomes, like bread flour versus baking flour versus other types of flour. Those wheats have different numbers of chromosomes. That was just incidentally, by the way. So in blue, as last class, these are vocabulary terms that I'd like you to be familiar with at the end of this chapter, and concepts. So you're going to see at the bottom we're talking about repetitive sequence and microsatellites. So let's go there.
Bacterial chromosomes are round. We already talked about this, eukaryotic chromosomes and features. We did this on the very first slide. Centromeres, telomeres, they're linear. So repetitive DNA, what is it? It's what it sounds like. What's the other, there are two big classes of DNA that we'll talk about. If one's called repetitive, what do you want to call the other class? You tell me the terminology you want to use. What, pardon? Non-repetitive, that works for me. Repetitive versus non. The textbook and others also call the other half of, not half, the other container, the other category of DNA unique. Non-repetitive. So a lot of us have some genes in our genomes. Each of those genes is unique, usually. There's one copy of that gene. It makes one protein. So unique sequences are often genes. Not always. There are always exceptions. So repetitive sequences are sequences you find, as the name suggests, not just once in your genome, but lots of places. One type of repetitive sequence looks something like this. Have I bored you yet? How much longer can you last? Are people falling asleep? What sort of a repetitive, so what, what's repetitive about this? What's the unit of the repetitive DNA? This is a long string of something that's repetitive. What's one unit? AT. So oftentimes, this will be annotated. There's one unit, it's AT. It's repeated over and over and over and over and over again. So how many times is it repeated? About 14. So the notation for having 14 units of AT in a row would be this, parentheses AT subscript 14. You use a superscript if you want, I don't care. There are 14 ATs in a row. This is repetitive sequence. This is also called a microsatellite sequence? Don't ask me why. Don't know. It's just one of those things you have to be familiar with. Geneticists call these microsatellites. There is a good reason for it, but I'm not going to bore you with the details. So one type of repetitive sequence. Are there other types of repetitive sequence? What's one of the really famous types? Sequences that you find in multiple copies, lots and lots of places in your genome or in another organism's genome. It's not just these simple sequence repeats. Right? This is a simple sequence, AT. It's repeated over and over again, so sometimes these are also called simple sequence repeats. I tell you that not because I want you to memorize it, but because I might slip and accidentally call it a simple sequence repeat instead of a microsatellite. In high school or maybe even middle school, did you look at examples in a textbook or anywhere of corn that had purple kernels and yellow kernels and blotchy kernels and things like that? Has anybody had this experience? A few of you. OK. So it turns out that another type of repetitive sequence, aside from this, microsatellites or simple sequence, is you also have TEs, transposable elements, AKA jumping genes. These are independent little bits of DNA that are in your genome, in my genome, in most species' genomes, in their chromosomes, that can actually cut themselves out and move somewhere else on a different chromosome and stick themselves in, sort of cut and paste style. And there are lots and lots and lots and lots of copies of these in our genomes. They're like, they're DNA viruses, basically. Their whole point in life is to replicate and to make more copies of themselves. At our expense, my genome and yours is littered with these things. 
So if there's anything, by the way, I know some of you have probably heard the term junk DNA used before. If anything really honestly counts as junk DNA, it's the transposable elements. Because that's all they do. They just make copies of themselves and they stick themselves in our chromosomes. Unfortunately for the geneticists, sometimes those transposable elements, when they stick themselves into our gene, maybe they do something bad. Maybe that disrupts the function of that gene. Maybe that gene no longer makes the protein it was supposed to. But sometimes they do good things for us, too. So it's hard to say that they're junk, because even though they're littering our genomes, sometimes they still do good things and bad things for us. Okay. I'm going to skip this exercise for now. We're going to come back to it at some point. And I hope you're comfortable with this. I'm certainly comfortable with skipping things that I prepared, because I prefer the questions that you were asking and being able to answer them. This is a technique using this online database that I would like you to be able to practice at some point, but we can come back to it. But I'm going to skip to the second. Just had some screenshots in here. Wow, look at all those screenshots. Since we're talking about transposable elements, simple sequence repeats, microsatellites, here's the chance for you to do something more interesting than just taking notes on your tablets. Go on your web browser to omim.org. Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man is what that stands for. This is a fabulous resource, not just in class, but in life. If you ever hear somebody say, you know, I've got this cousin that has this disease, or my family suffers from this disease, this is a great place to start, especially now that you're going to be learning how to be a critical thinker or continue learning how to be a critical thinker, how to assess data. So when you go to OMIM, So as I suggest here, you can do any sort of number of searches. You could, if you have a disease in mind, if you're curious about something, type it in. See what you find. See what this record looks like. So you, as I said up here, you can use a genetic disease name. You could use the name of a gene. So you're interested in a particular gene, or I give you an assignment to learn about DNA polymerase gamma. So you go to OMIM. Type in DNA polymerase gamma, see if there are any known human genetic diseases associated with that protein. Has anybody come up with a disease that has a genetic basis? That is, did you get search results? Which one? Hyperplasia. Hyperplasia? Excess growth of something? Don't you love autocomplete? Man. Anybody else? Don't have to share, but. Disease. Which one? Gaucher disease. Gaucher disease. Yeah. So the nice thing about OMIM is it's only diseases that have a genetic basis. So if you hit something that's totally environmental, like obesity, there is some genetic predisposition to obesity. So if you type in obesity, you'll probably get a lot of hits. For this example, I typed in which you can see up here, although just barely. My search term was CAG microsatellites. What does that mean in terms of what we know about microsatellites? Can you help me interpret what you think it means when I say CAG microsatellite? So that would be a repetitive sequence that's just CAG. CAG, CAG, CAG. So are there any human diseases that are caused by CAG microsatellites? Screenshot, not a live shot, but what do you think? Androgen receptor. So it turns out there are some androgen insensitivity syndromes where males make testosterone, but we can't tell that we're making our own testosterone. So we get a little bit more feminized. I speak we generically. I don't know. Who knows? What else? Machado-Joseph disease, prostate cancer. So there's some genetic component of have somewhere in your genome having CAG, 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 CAG has something to do with getting prostate cancer. And then we get down to number five, spinocerebellar ataxia, which basically, do you know, does anybody know ataxia? A means not. Ataxia is usually something to do with gait. 
walking, something like that. People that have ataxias can't walk well. They fall over. They're, they have poor balance, those sorts of things. There are lots of diseases that have CAG repeats in genes that cause disease. One of you, at least, on day one in the quiz survey, mentioned Huntington disease. It's a great example of a pretty common neurodegenerative disease where there's a protein that's called Huntington. HTT is its human abbreviation. It's a gene that makes a protein. The protein's called Huntington. And it tends to be that when you have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of CAGs inside this gene, you get this disease. You have very few CAGs, three, four, five, ten in a row, you're okay. But if that repetitive sequence grows and grows and grows until you have like 20 copies of CAG or 40 copies of CAG or more, then you're heavily predisposed to getting Huntington's disease. So one of the things we get to learn about this term is why is that the case? Why is it that these simple sequence repeats cause disease? What is it about where they are in the gene, how big they are? What is it about them that causes things like Huntington's disease? So I do encourage you to spend time on OMIM if you have any interest in human molecular genetics and human genetic disorders. And do we have, there's a little bit more to do still, but just broadly speaking, any questions at all about what we've talked about today, about the chapter 10 material that you've read so far? Sure. So why is it that there's this, in a lot of these triplet, I'm going to use a new phrase, I'm not going to use a new phrase. A lot of these situations where there's a simple sequence repeat that expands, you go from two copies to maybe in your, and by the way, Simple sequence repeats tend to expand across generations. So I've got a small number of CAGs in my Huntington gene. Everybody does. That's natural. But some of us might pass on slightly longer versions of that CAG repeat to our kids. And they might, by chance, happen to pass on even longer versions to their kids. And over time, you get longer and longer CAG repeats inside this gene, and at some point then Maybe you actually, or one of your aunts, or one of your offspring, right? Kids, grandkids, great grandkids gets Huntington's disease. It's not so much, and we can talk more in detail about this. It's not so much about where in the gene it is. It's really, it really is about the length. And there's not just this is one of those many types of human diseases where there's not just one gene that causes it. It's that gene plus maybe this gene over here and that gene over there, and it's a combination of both your environment and Lots of different genes that all come together to produce those sorts of disorders. Other questions? OK. So quick statement on this, and then there's going to be a Socrative wind up. One more question. Uh, yeah, so, so here's what we're going to be doing for next class. Ah, so this is a fabulous question that's directly relevant to this chapter. Why, and this chapter started off talking about genome size differences. Well, just a quick answer to that question. The girl whose metaphase chromosomes we were looking at in slide one before class, how big is her genome compared to her parents' genomes? It's twice as big. She's got twice as many chromosomes. She's got twice as much DNA. So just that quickly, you can go to having twice the amount of DNA in your genome. Now, for her, she's not likely to pass that on to her kids because she's probably sterile. She probably didn't even survive to reproduce. But in many cases, there are reasonable ways to 
determine or distinguish why genome sizes change rapidly over time. We'll do a, a bit of that in class here and probably more so in evolution if you're heading that direction, biology 105. So what I'd love for you to do next time is, this is not required, optional, find a drawing app. I provide a couple of options up here that I know are available for free on the iPads. You might be able to find these also for other tablet platforms. They will allow you to create, just draw and distribute, i.e. upload to Google Drive or email attached to me an image. Find a photograph, like the one we started looking at at the beginning of class, a photograph of a chromosome or a set of chromosomes. Not a drawing of a chromosome, not a cartoon of a chromosome, an actual photograph somebody took through a microscope of a chromosome. And draw how you think that chromosome is related to a double helix. So how does the double helix relate, the double helix, two strands of DNA base paired together and twisted around each other, how does that relate to what we see under a microscope when we look at a chromosome? There's no reading assignment for next class. We're still finishing up chapter 10. So you've read chapter 10 for today. That's fine for tomorrow. So no more reading for Wednesday. Lastly, please turn your attention to Socrative. There's a really quick two-question Not for points, this is for attendance, but do your best. I really value your feedback that you're going to give me. And so you're giving me feedback now will help me help you next class. I pressed the button. Oh, it didn't start. I apologize. There it goes. I swear, I poked the button. Um, I prefer ID number because it's easier to sort that way. But with so many of you in class, ID numbers are unique. Names sometimes aren't. And sometimes the name you use in class doesn't match up with the registrar's record of what your name really is, or you've been married, or something else. So ID number is always better. Other questions, concerns? If you have any issues, raise your hand. I'll run over.